Welcome. The case of South Africa, which we examined in the last lecture, demonstrates that the winds of change sweeping Africa in the 1950s and 60s were not, after all, irresistible, at least in the shorter or even medium run. South Africa was not alone. The march of majority rule independence, beginning in West Africa, moving east, then eventually wheeling south, came to a halt. The Zambezi River might serve as a symbolic barrier, as we mentioned in Lecture 24, the Zambezi separating northern Rhodesia from southern Rhodesia, Zambia becoming independent under African rule in 1964, southern Rhodesia pursuing a very different course, as we will describe in a few minutes. Virtually all of the African territories which resisted rule by Africans were what we have defined as settler colonies. Those where substantial numbers of Europeans, of whites, came to take up land and livelihoods with the expectation that they and their descendants would stay, that they were a permanently immigrant, a permanently transplanted fraction from the mother country. It should hardly surprise us that most European or white settlers had rather little sympathy for majority rule. There were certainly exceptions. But typically, uh, they enjoyed a far better lifestyle than they could have dreamed of back in the, in the metropole. The weather was better. I sometimes uh, ask my students, uh, imagine, or go better yet, spend a winter in London, then spend one in, oh, say, Harare, capital of Zimbabwe, and see which you, you prefer. Now, on a more substantive level, the, the large yard, the veranda, the swimming pool, and maybe best of all, the servants, the housekeeper, the gardener. All of this was possible in the settler colonies and available not just to the upper or, or middle classes. The semi-skilled, the artisanal people could enjoy some of the amenities, some of the lifestyle that I just described, again, under quite sunny skies very often. So this was something that was a, a possibility for the mechanic, for, for the, mil, uh, the, the builder, the, the guy who lays concrete, you know, the telephone repairman. Uh, things that would hardly have been dreamed of in the colonial, uh, in the, yes, in the metropolitan capitals. So these people understandably felt that they had something to hold on to. And increasingly, they concluded in the face of what was happening in many parts of Africa, all over Africa, really, in the middle of the 20th century, they incre increasingly concluded that they or their metropolitan sponsors, uh, both perhaps, uh, or preferably, would have to fight for it. Now, the territories of Angola and Mozambique were, of course, settler colonies, in fact, they became more settler uh, after the Second World War when tens of thousands of additional settlers from Portugal came there to live. But as I just implied, they were also the colonies of Portugal. And this fact made a difference. I mean of Portugal vis-a-vis -vis France and Britain, for instance. You can argue that it was the fact of Portuguese possession equally important, perhaps more important, than the realities of settler rule, I think both were, were very important. But why is, it the, uh, why is the factor of Portuguese possession uh, important in understanding these cases of the so-called delayed uh, decolonizations? First of all, Portugal, back in Portugal, was ruled in quite authoritarian uh, some would say dictatorial fashion, for a very substantial portion of the early, middle, and into the late uh, years of the 20th century. 
the rulers of Portugal, such as Salazar, showed very considerable sympathy, and I'm, I'm not putting words in their mouth, uh, for, for fascism. Uh, and could be described, I think, fairly described, as, as at least quasi-fascist in, uh, in their methods of rule. Now, the significance of this is that uh, compared to, to Britain or France, there was an absence of even a, a theoretical uh, commitment, as it were, to the, the virtues of democracy, for instance. There, there was not the, the rhetoric of democracy, at the very least, um, in, in the case of Portugal and its colonies. So there was no pretense uh, of the sort of thing that Britain and France uh, certainly claimed they were doing, and in some respects were doing. Certainly by the 1950s, at least late in the day of the colonial uh, regimes in the case of the French and the British, that is uh, bequeathing parliamentary institutions, bequeathing the, the best of, of ideas and practices of, of Western democracy to the colonies which they increasingly knew they were going to be uh, departing. There's no pretense of, of doing that sort of thing, of leaving that sort of legacy of colonialism uh, behind in the Portuguese colonies, and that in turn perhaps even more important, meant that the ability of African nationalists to exploit that rhetoric, to exploit that, that commitment to democracy was, was absent. When we looked at, at decolonization, the nationalist movements in the, in the French Empire, for instance, the, the way in which politicians from, from West Africa, like Senghor or, or Houphoué, would seize upon uh, the French talk whenever it arose about citizenship, for instance, a greater citizenship for a greater France, and so on, and in a sense challenge them to match their words uh, with their actions, to put their money where their mouth was. Uh, there, there were no such uh, spaces for the utilization of the colonizer's own uh, uh, superficial, at least, stance uh, to, to, to exploit. Now, unlike England or France, again, Portugal, to turn to the economic side of this, was itself a poor country. And this meant that unlike England or France, or indeed even like Belgium, Portugal did not have the benefit of what someone like uh, Kwame Nkrumah from Ghana would have called, with, with some accuracy perhaps, uh, the, the neo-colonial option. That is, go ahead, grant independence, and depend on your economic power, or at least hope that your economic power can continue to permit you, allow you to gain at least some benefits from the, the resources and markets of your former uh, colonies. So Portugal concluded, unlike these more uh, economically muscular uh, colonizing powers in Africa, that it could not relinquish its empire. It couldn't even loosen the reins on its colonies in response to African nationalism. This line of thought went, lose the empire and you lose everything. We don't have that option of turning to other means of getting the things we may want or need. Needless to say, Portuguese settlers, and again, increasing numbers of settlers, concurred in this view that to give up the empire, of course, uh, threatened everything that they had gone to Africa uh, for in the first place. So, whereas earlier we made a, a, an assertion, a judgment, that the yoke, the burden of, of colonialism in comparative terms was relatively heavy in, in the Portuguese territories in terms of the longevity of forced cultivation or forced labor or what have you, it's also true that they were particularly uh, heavy-handed uh, on, on nascent African political movements when this emerged in the, in the very late 50s and early 60s. To put it bluntly, those movements were crushed and, and banned. Um, and early on, certainly by the early 1960s, the nationalists had decided to take up arms against the colonists, the Portuguese, and against the settlers. Now, there are echoes in that dynamic with what we saw in the last 
uh, lecture in South Africa, of course, of this, this polarization and uh, the uh, embrace, essentially, of uh, very uh, militant um, uh, approaches on both sides. But it, it, in a sense, there was never the, the, the phase in the Portuguese colonies of the open, uh, you know, uh, constitutional protests, mass demonstrations, and so forth, that was, was a feature of South African life in the 1950s. We go very quickly to the, the completely polarized uh, situation. Now, rather like the Belgian Congo, both Angola and Mozambique were, were huge territories. They were vast. Like Belgian Congo, they had been parceled out to various concessionaires, uh, private companies which were responsible and given the, the exclusive rights very often to, to take out the cotton or uh, tin or what have you. Uh, like the Belgian Congo, and, and a feature of the tremendous size here, they contained a multitude of ethnicities with little in common, except for perhaps their, their common suffering. Now, in light of all this, it's slightly surprising that in Mozambique, a single liberation movement known as Frelimo, uh, the front for the liberation of, of Mozambique in, in Portuguese, uh, the the acronym for LIMO. In, in Mozambique, a single liberation movement came to, to dominate the, the anti-Portuguese uh, struggle. This was not the case in Angola, where three different armed movements emerged, each with, uh, each with its own ethnic base and uh, also showing considerable ideological uh, differences. They were the FNLA in the, the north, based on the old Congo um, uh, ethnicity, and uh, led by Holden Roberto. Uh, the MPLA, the Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, uh, around the capital city of Luanda and in the central belt, based ethnically on the Kimbundu or Imbundu peoples, but also drawing a lot of support from the uh, tiny uh, category class in Angola known as the Assimilados, that is highly educated uh, intellectuals, the intelligentsia, if you like. Some of those, in turn, were uh, drawn from the mestizos, those of mixed Portuguese and African descent, uh, a, a fact that in some cases was uh, a, a sort of easy target for, for the rival nationalist movements. And certainly the MPLA was uh, the one which gave its greatest embrace to a more radical approaches and indeed called itself a, a Marxist movement. And then based in the central highlands, the, the eastern portions of the country and in the south was the, the UNITA movement, the Union for Total Independence in Angola, led by a very charismatic figure, a, a, a large man with a tremendous amount of uh, command and, and charm uh, in the view of many, Jonas Savimbi, the ethnic base here, the, the Ovambundu people. In both Mozambique and Angola, Beginning in the 1960s, war ensued. By 1974, however, the tide was turned, not by events which unfolded in Africa itself, but back uh, in Portugal. Young Portuguese military officers had concluded, had decided that these wars were endless and unwinnable as they looked at the rest of the 20th uh, century. And that, perhaps equally, maybe more important, that Portugal's future uh, ought to lie with Europe. They looked at things like the, the burgeoning common market, and of course that has developed into the European Union, and stressed that the new Portugal should find its economic and indeed its political destiny uh, there. That empires, after all, were uh, 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 outdated, atavistic, remnant of the past. They staged a military coup in Portugal itself and very quickly, within 12 months or so, moved to end something over 400 years, at least at the coastal areas, 400 years of Portuguese colonialism. Now, in Mozambique, at first, certainly at the time of these actions in 1974 and 1975, the Portuguese coup and within uh, a year or so of that, the, the withdrawal of Portuguese political power. In Mozambique, that transition went quite smoothly. 
After all, as we noted before, Fray Limo was the clear heir apparent and came to power under another very charismatic uh, figure, um, although uh, his ideology was very different from Jonas Savimbi's in the other side of the continent, in the sense that Machel uh, also was a self-styled uh, socialist. Now, the transition did not go smoothly in Angola, and again, we see a distinction between these two territories. As Independence Day approached uh, in November of 1975, a veritable free-for-all broke out. I remember these days very clearly. I was working actually on Capitol Hill and um, trying to avoid doing my dissertation uh, at that point and working for a, a Washington, it's called the Washington Office on Africa, an information center uh, there on Capitol Hill. And there were these late night sessions of Congress and reports from the UN and so forth. All of this focusing on the coming uh, Independence Day in uh, Angola and nobody really, frankly, sure what was gonna happen. These three rivals were still very much at it. At this point, not so much with the departing Portuguese, of course, as, as with each other. And it's at this point that we must introduce again, as we did in, in the lecture number 25 on uh, the Belgian Congo, the all-important context of the Cold War, this ongoing competition for, for world uh, prestige, power, et cetera, between the Western powers and, and the, the Soviet Union and, and its uh, satellite powers. In the weeks, uh, months leading up to the Independence Days, uh, set for November of 1975, uh, several foreign powers uh, quite clearly and openly backed uh, their, their favored movements. Um, and the most visible examples of this were uh, an invasion from South Africa in support of UNITA and uh, Jonas Savimbi's, uh, at least, uh, alleged conservatism. Uh, Cuba, on the other hand, intervened with thousands of troops in support of the MPLA, their fellow Marxists. The Soviet Union played a, a supporting role in that. And finally, the United States um, uh, certainly provided uh, financial assistance and materiel uh, also at first in favor of the FNLA, but later also uh, with South Africa, on the same side as South Africa, uh, on behalf of, uh, of UNITA. In the short run, the socialist MPLA came out on top, uh, but its position was exceedingly shaky. Alas, in neither Angola or Mozambique did independence signal the end of conflict. Remember that apartheid South Africa had regarded, had regarded the Portuguese colonies as buffers against the southward tide of majority rule. After all, the Portuguese territories, which in one case Mozambique bordered South Africa, in the other bordered the South African-controlled territory of Southwest Africa, these were indeed seen as uh, buffers against this uh, tide rolling southward uh, of majority rule. If anything, the Portuguese exit then prompted a much greater South African intervention, again, the first indication of a, of a South African willingness to, to play a much expanded role in these former buffer states was the entry into Angola in 1975, which uh, was uh, not successful in the, in the shorter uh, run, or in the long run for that matter, but nonetheless, it was echoed soon enough in Mozambique. In Mozambique, a movement which drew support both ethnically and from resentment over uh, radical measures instituted by Frelimo, such as um, uh, collective farms and, and so forth, very, um, very Soviet bloc style measures in some cases carried out or attempted, carry, attempted to be carried out by Samora Michel and his ruling Frelimo party. Uh, the movement in uh, entitled Renamo, or MNR, the N Mozambique National Resistance, developed, um, again, capitalized on certain uh, perceived to be excluded ethnic bases, um, alienated from the Frelimo government, and, and also tapped into resentment uh, over these uh, radical measures. South Africa began to back Renamo uh, quite uh, heavily as well, 
And after a further decade of war, essentially the 1980s, uh, the end of South African participation uh, in 1990, the sides negotiated a settlement. Since then, Mozambique has forged a rather remarkable recovery. After all, this was a country that uh, certainly was one of the poorest countries in the world, and, and in some respects remains that, but nonetheless is often cited today as one of Africa's success stories. Angola, once again, uh, was considerably uh, worse. With hardly a break after independence in 1975, civil war continued for another quarter of a century. There are many Angolans today who have never known peace until the last couple of years when finally with the capture and killing of Jonas Savimbi, uh, something like uh, a ceasefire and truce uh, ensued. Perhaps Mozambique will serve as an inspiration for the rebuilding of Angola. Let us now turn to southern Rhodesia, which uh, is, of course, now known as Zimbabwe. From 1953 to 1963, southern Rhodesia had been joined with northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland, which are now Zambia and Malawi, in the Central African Federation. The Federation experiment, driven by the region's white settlers, most of whom were in southern Rhodesia, created an economically advantageous bloc, uh, certainly, and it also advertised itself as an alternative to either majority rule to the north or the rigidity of apartheid to its, to its south. It is fair to say, I, I do think this is fair to say, however, that most Africans uh, in the Federation saw the official policy of, of uh, so-called partnership as a, a form of, moderated form, but a moderated form of white supremacy. The Federation broke apart, as we saw in an earlier lecture, on the shoals of African nationalism. The British acceded to African demands and granted independence to Malawi in 1963, Zambia in 1964, and might well uh, have done the same in southern Rhodesia. However, southern Rhodesia's settlers had other ideas. If you recall for a moment the case in Kenya where there were white settlers, but not nearly of the numbers that we find in southern Rhodesia, the settlers in Kenya lacked the power to defy Great Britain when the moment came that Britain uh, decided that it would uh, negotiate with African nationalists and grant uh, uh, independence. In southern Rhodesia, things took a very different turn. Led by the redoubtable Ian Smith, uh, a, a former RAF pilot, a cattle rancher in the southern part of the, the country, and a, and a guy with um, a very considerable streak of, uh, of, of defiant toughness to him, the settler government in uh, southern Rhodesia declared so-called Unilateral Declaration of Independence, UDI, in 1965. And I'd like to read you a, a couple of uh, phrases from the, the UDI, the Unilateral Declaration of Independence, uh, issued on the 11th of November of 1965. It begins this way, Whereas in the course of human affairs, history has shown that it may be necessary for a people to resolve the political affiliations which have connected them with another people, and to assume among other nations the separate and equal status to which they're entitled. And whereas in such event a respect for the opinions of mankind requires them to declare to other nations the causes which impel them to assume full responsibility for their own affairs, goes on, we now sever our connection with Britain. The language, I'm sure, rings a bell with you. It is borrowed very directly from the U.S. Declaration of Independence, and despite the fact that it's two centuries later, and of course the context is completely different, structurally speaking, there is some similarity here. You have prominent uh, settlers, or descendants of settlers, in a colonial situation, declaring that they are going to sever their connections with the old empire. Now, in the aftermath of the U.S. Declaration, of course, there was a war, the Revolutionary War, we know that. This was threatened in the case of Rhodesia, but it never materialized. Uh, what did materialize were international sanctions proposed by Britain and eventually adopted by the, the United Nations and so forth, economic sanctions. It was essentially a, a boycott or a cordon, if you like, around Rhodesia. Um, 
uh, in the aftermath of UDI, soon the, the major African nationalist parties, which were ZANU, Zimbabwe African National Union, and ZAPU, the Zimbabwe African People's Union, were banned. Uh, the leadership imprisoned. That leadership included Robert Mugabe, who was put into jail in 1965, where he stayed for, for a decade. For a time, Ian Smith enjoyed a honeymoon, and indeed the, the sort of self-sufficiency uh, which the sanctions imposed on, uh, on Rhodesia, as it now called itself. There was no need to call it Southern Rhodesia anymore, since Northern Rhodesia had, had become Zambia. Uh, Rhodesia uh, actually did rather well economically in the early years. This was not to last. Uh, in the early 70s, a genuine guerrilla war. And this came to be known as the second Shimaringa, the second sh uh, struggle in the Shona language. The first, of course, was the rebellion against uh, Rhodes's British South Africa Company in the, the 1890s. That war picked up uh, steam after 1975, and it did so especially uh, on the part of ZANU, Mugabe's movement, because they were now able to take advantage of Mozambique's independence from, from, uh, from, from Portugal. The ways in which all of these processes, all of these stories are unfolded in a regional context, and indeed in a global context, is something that I think we, we need to emphasize here. These are not simply internal processes in any case. They are increasingly regional, cross-border, internationalized uh, cases of, of politics and decolonization. The two liberation movements in uh, Zimbabwe forged a paper alliance, the Patriotic Front, but in fact they never co uh, cooperated. The war deepened, and it was a terrible war. Atrocities were committed on all sides in this war. Some people were put in impossible positions. Village headmen or chief approached by the, the government forces from, from Smith's government uh, during the day and uh, asked and challenged if they were giving support to the, to the guerrillas. If the evidence were not forthcoming that they were refusing to do so, uh, the punishment could be very severe indeed in terms of torture and and killing. The same night, you could be visited by the emissaries from the local guerrillas operating in the bush. This is what uh, they were called in the capital, the boys in the bush, the Bagomana, who would uh, literally pull the entire village out of, uh, out of the, their homes and, and announce a pungwe. Today, this means an all-night party with music and everything, but at that time, it was, it was musical, but these were uh, enforced sessions where people were forced to, to sing the liberation songs uh, and, and so on and so on. And again, this, this man in the middle, the notion of uh, you'd better not deny, you better not provide support to the guerrillas or we may shoot you, and uh, being approached from the other side by uh, ZANU or ZAPU and being told that if you don't provide us support, uh, we may shoot you. Now, this war resulted ultimately in, uh, in 30,000 dead and a million refugees. Eventually, Smith negotiated an agreement, and to some people's surprise, ZANU, Robert Mugabe's movement, uh, won an impressive victory in what is generally considered to be a free and fair election, and assumed the, the leadership, the premiership of what was renamed in April of uh, 1980 Zimbabwe. And that, of course, is where he remains today. We will look at the Zimbabwean situation in Lecture 35, but I think we can see some of the important roots of the contemporary crisis in what we've just been talking about. Finally, we should mention Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia. South Africa, after all, had run the place under a League of Nations mandate originally uh, since the German defeat in 1918. Not surprisingly, a protracted low-level liberation war developed in this uh, country as well, although it was low-level partly because the, the population in this largely desert uh, country is, um, is, is slight. The Namibian or, or Southwestern African struggle uh, overlapped very much with the Angolan one, and the interpenetration around the border between Angola and Namibia was almost uh, inexplicable and, uh, in some instances. The United Nations, which had inherited the, the old League of Nations mandate, which considered South Africa's occupation illegal, they had declared it illegal uh, at, at, at various points since the 1960s, eventually supervised elections leading to independence in 1990. But there's no doubt that the big shift that brought that about, uh, as well as, as, in some respects, what brought the uh, accommodation in Mozambique, 
were the shifts in South Africa itself, centered around Mandela's release, the legalization of uh, the ANC and other changes in South Africa. So once again, we see this regional context, how what happens in one country affects another, what happens on the global level is played out in, in these uh, examples of, of decolonization. All of these former settlers then um, eventually uh, won their, excuse me, all of these former settler colonies then eventually won their independence. But the scars left by their struggles run particularly deep, are especially painful, and have ongoing uh, relevance. We will see that, I think, very clearly in our penultimate lecture in this course, our look at Zimbabwe's current crisis. Thank you.